Hello and welcome to this week's lecture. The topic this week looks at how we can begin to address the complexity in the world's wicked sustainability challenges. We look at understanding what a system is, how its components are interrelated, and how those interrelationships are sometimes mutually reinforcing in a positive and negative way through exploring feedback loops. We then consider how to intervene in a system to address and unpack its complexity and the root causes of the wicked problem. For business, that means understanding its role as part of a wider and an open system. While businesses cannot singularly resolve sustainability challenges, it's important to consider how various organizations and sectors and what role they can play in addressing some of these challenges. But let's start this section with the Sufi story. It tells of a village of blind men. One day, a new creature arrived to the village. Each of the blind men touched one part of the creature and declared that they knew what it was. One said it was a snake, one said it was a carpet, and one said it was a set of columns. But by only experiencing one part of it, each was wrong. In our everyday lives, we also tend to look at things in their parts rather than experiencing the world as a whole. Yet we know that the world is much more complex. And if we are to understand its complexity, we need to think about the bigger picture. So in other words, we need to think in systems. So that brings us to this week's topic, Intended Learning Outcomes. So at the end of this lecture, you should be able to define systems and systems thinking. You should be able to describe the characteristics of a system, and you should be able to describe the role of systems thinking in understanding sustainability. So let's kick things off with the first topic, ILO. What are systems and systems thinking? For this particular ILO, I'm going to play you a short video which offers a very good overview of systems and systems thinking. Systems thinking, a way to maximize program effectiveness. Systems thinking, maybe you've heard of it, are doing it, or you've heard that you should be doing it. What is it, and what does it mean for the senior manager? Let's start by looking at what a system is. A system is any kind of entity that is made up of parts that interact. Together, these parts and their interconnections create a whole, which in turn produces some kind of result. Using a systems perspective is important because it helps us to better understand what helps or hinders the success of health interventions. Here's an example. Meet Suzanne. Suzanne is a senior manager in a large regional health organization. The high rate of obesity is an issue in her community, and she's been mandated to address this problem. Her first instinct is to develop a program to get more people active. But what is realistic to expect from this approach? Systems thinkers believe that viewing a program like this, a part, in isolation of the larger system within which it operates, the whole, tends to ignore other aspects that might influence its potential for impact. Why? Research tells us that obesity is the result of a combination of many physiological, psychological, social, environmental, and economic factors that all interact with one another. For example, at the individual level, there are issues such as human physiology, exercise habits, food choices, and one's occupation. But beyond the individual, there are other factors at play such as the local built environment, quick and easy access to junk food, and larger food industry practices such as trends in portion sizes, sugar, and fat content. The interaction of all these influences make obesity the product of what we call a complex system. If Suzanne were to use a systems approach, she would realize that relying on simple linear cause and effect solutions for one program would ignore those interactions and likely fail. While Suzanne's staff at the program level have a tendency to think only within the boundaries of their program, senior managers and planners like Suzanne are in a unique position to do what systems thinkers call zooming out. Zooming out considers how other aspects outside of a program's traditional boundaries, both within the organization and beyond, might influence the success of the program. 
By zooming out and looking at the influence of other interventions, policies, structures, patterns, and norms in the broader system, Suzanne is better able to strategically consider other values and perspectives and the interrelationships among each that may impact obesity rates in her community. In doing so, she can identify more powerful leverage points outside of the program that have the potential to facilitate and support changes in obesity. Leverage points are places within the system that can be tweaked in a way that supports greater impact. For example, are there actions Suzanne and her team might take that could increase the community's access to opportunities for physical activity? While some leverage points are within Suzanne's capacity to change, others will be beyond her control. However, it will still be useful to be aware of these as she plans for the program. Adopting a systems view won't change the boundaries of this program, but it will expand the boundaries of the evaluation. By recognizing the importance of the different perspectives and values of those outside the program and the interrelationships throughout the system, Suzanne can ensure that the evaluation is framed in a way that captures the key boundaries, diverse perspectives, and interrelationships that serve as important leverage points in the system. Of course, Suzanne's budget won't permit an evaluation of the entire system, but she can ensure that any evaluation she commissions will provide her with more strategic direction on how to effectively address obesity within her community. For example, in addition to recommendations for improving the program, the results of the evaluation might indicate opportunities for new partnerships or external policy change. If her community has poor walking and cycling infrastructure, where might she and her team advocate? Or who could they collaborate with to make changes? By asking these questions, Suzanne is finding that using a systems approach helps her focus on the broader issue of obesity in her community instead of a single program in her organization. She gains a better understanding of what external factors are influencing the program's success and can set more reasonable expectations of what it can accomplish. She's also learning what needs to change both within and outside of the program to better maximize her organization's effectiveness. Many now believe that a systems approach holds the most promise for addressing complex health problems like obesity, which is not only good for Suzanne, but good for everyone. So from the video, we can see that a system is two or more parts interacting to function as a whole within some boundary. The elements and processes of a system interact and they affect um, one another, often in ways that we cannot see. So in systems, the relationship among the parts matters. So if elements or part of a system are added or taken away, the, beha the, whole, the behavior of the whole system then changes. So it's important to understand that a system is made up of a number of parts, but you need to look at the whole and how those parts interact in order to make the whole function. So the tools and habits of systems thinking help us to identify when our or others' short-term solutions may have dangerous long-term consequences. It can help us to carefully contemplate our own assumptions and our own way of thinking, to perform rigorous analysis as well as deeper personal reflection. These are all very important skills that you as 21st century learners and leaders are going to need in order to deal with the social, economic, political, and environmental complexities that you'll be inheriting, much of which is often the result of less than systemic thinking. A systems approach encourages the exploration of the relationship between the social, environmental, and economic interactions, so the three pillars of sustainability. So this approach resists breaking a problem into its component parts for detailed examination. So by examining the links and the interrelationships of the whole system, patterns and themes emerge which offer insights a new meaning to the initial problem. So in the context of any sustainability related issues such as climate change, overpopulation or obesity, encouraging a diversity of views can lead to a new understanding of the situation and the identifications of opportunities for action that might not have otherwise occurred. 
So we've come to the end of the first Tylo. And for this, we'd, for the review and reflect section, I'd like you to answer these multiple choice questions. These are the answers to the questions. Um, I hope you managed to get all five out of five right. We now move to the second topic, ILO, looking at the characteristics of a system. We'll, you'll actually be introduced to two key frameworks uh, for systems thinking, the six steps of systems analysis and the iceberg model. That you will notice that there's quite a bit of commonality to the two approaches, but it's still important that you introduce to at least those two to understand them better. So there are a number of essential concepts in systems thinking, and many of these are familiar terms in other fields, such as engineering or the sciences, but they have a particular meaning when talking about complex systems. So for example, when we talk about things like feedback, variables, and causality. So as I said, let's start with the first of the two frameworks, which is the six steps of systems analysis. So we believe that this will help you with not only understanding the key concepts and characteristics, but how they fit together to develop systems thinking. So the six steps of systems analysis are tell the story, name the variables, determine the system boundaries, sketch the trends, make the system visible, and look for leverage for sustainability. Starting with step one, it's important to tell the story because very often um, when we looked at wicked problems, if you jump straight to defining the problem, that can often lead to um, ineffective analysis and ineffective solutions. So it's important to begin with the story, an account of some particular event or events. So tell the story you want to analyze with one or more people. Use your own words and encourage listeners to ask questions to clarify their own understanding. Therefore, everyone should be clear about what the story is about and the scope and boundary of the story. Then you need to name the variables, which are a set of nouns or noun phrases that go up and down over time. So a systems thinker would then ask, what are the key variables in this story? And how does a change in this variable affect variables in this story? For step three, it's important to determine the system boundaries. Like you would have seen in the video in the last um, topic ILO, you really need to ask the question of, is the boundary we set around the system appropriate for our analysis? So if you are analyzing a, say an issue around employee absenteeism at work, you know, that might be quite a complex problem that you're trying to solve, but who are the stakeholders and what are the boundaries around which you frame that particular question? So, um, or story or other. So it's important that you're clear about who is included and what the scope of the particular system is. So one of the basic system thinking tools is a behavior over time graph. It's a visual tool which helps us to see trends. So how variables change over time. Sometimes sketching more than one variable on the same behavior over time graph can help us to see the relationship between the variables. So if you look at this particular um, graph on this chart, 
So on the, on the y-axis, you have something that's changing and the x-axis is always time. And the blue line over here tells the story of how the particular element changes over time. So if we stick to the <clears throat> issue of employee absenteeism, you know, you might be able to say, well, absenteeism tends to go up and down at particular points in the year, in the month, uh, or based on particular deadlines. So that might be the rate of absenteeism, but you might also want to chart um, something around, say, you know, public holidays or, you know, other significant events in the timeline that can create a relationship between those variables, etc. So it's important to understand how the story changes over time. Now for step five, there are many graphic tools that can be used to better understand a story. So in this step, we'll look at two that will help you see the dynamics of a system by looking at the relationship among those key variables. Stock flow diagrams and feedback loop diagrams will be used to illustrate or to make the system visible. Starting with stocks and flows, over here we have an example of a bathtub. So the water in a particular bathtub is a stock and flows are when you know, water is coming into the bathtub and being drained out of the bathtub. You can also think of your bank account and the money you have in a particular bank account as a stock. As you make deposits and as you make withdrawals, that stock changes and varies over time. So a stock is the foundation of any system. They're the elements of the system that you can see, feel, count, or measure at any given time. However, as we've seen with the example of the bathtub or your bank account, stocks change over time depending on the actions of the flow. So as I described um, in the last slide, when you add water or drain water, that represents an inflow and an outflow. So that's, those are the flows. So a system is made up of stocks and flows. Here are some other examples of stocks and flows. So as I said, the bank account making a deposit is an inflow. When you talk about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in relation to climate change, when you add carbon dioxide, it means the um, stock of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up. You know, similarly, if you think of your self-esteem as a stock, you know, you need to do, in, encourage or be involved in activities that help to build that self-esteem over time to increase the stock. We now turn to the second concept in terms of how stocks and flows can be related. And this is through the idea of feedback loops. So a feedback loop is formed when changes in a stock affect the flows into or out of the same stock. So in this case, interest rate is one of the key mechanisms through which those feedback loops are created. So the total amount of money in an account affects how much money comes into the account as interest. So when you have more in your bank account, you earn more interest. So feedback loops can um, cause stocks to maintain their level within a range or go up or go down. So the stock level therefore feeds back through a chain of signals and actions to control itself. Now we're going to look at two types of feedback loops. The first one is called a stabilizing loop or a balancing feedback. I prefer the word balancing feedback. Um, and so using the example of the energy levels of a coffee drinker, so you have your stored energy in the body. If you drink coffee, your energy goes up, but then you use that energy as well. So over time it balances. So this kind of feedback loop stabilizes um, the stock level. So it may not remain completely fixed, but it does stay within an acceptable range. So you will know when you've had too much coffee and you'll stop drinking it so you, body ends up using that energy and you go back to the state you were in um, preferably before you started drinking the coffee. So you have that natural balance of things. 
The second kind of feedback loop is called a reinforcing or sometimes called a runaway loop. Um, they're found whenever a system has the ability to reproduce itself or to grow. And those elements, for example, include populations and economies. So if you were to leave your bank account with X amount of money, um, you will continue to earn interest on that money without, if you don't make any withdrawals, that'll just continue to grow. And if you think about it from a more sustainability point of view, something like the global population. So if we continue to have more births than we have deaths, you over time, as we've seen, the population just continues to grow. So that's called a runaway loop. And it's the same thing with, um, say, overfishing in the ocean. So if you, if you fish more quickly than fish have the time to be able to regenerate or reproduce themselves, you'll reach a stage where there's no fish in the ocean. So you need to have a combination basically of a reinforcing and a balancing loop in order to keep um, things in equilibrium. Well, at this point, um, you're probably asking, well, so what, how does all of this analysis of variables and causal loops help everyday people deal with sustainability issues? Well, that's a very good question. Um, to understand the answer, we need to weave into our systems analysis a critical missing component, that of human impact on the natural world. So for a variety of reasons, often good ones, um, humans disrupt the patterns of nature. In systems thinking language, we could say that our daily actions impact one or more variables in a particular system. Because many people um, are unaware that when they tinker with one part of the system, it affects everything else that's connected to it, we end up with unintended consequences, such as overpopulation and climate change. So systems thinking then helps us to see how our actions may or may not be contributing to the sustainability of our environment. Once we know how the natural patterns um, of a living system work, how they work separate from human impact, we can more easily see where and how people's choices have interrupted and redirected cycles. We can then consider ways to shift to more sustainable options based on new choices. Leverage points are therefore places within a complex system, you know, such as a company, an economy, a living body, city, ecosystem, where a small shift in one thing can produce big changes in other things. So if we're trying to fix or change a system through technology, new government policy, or other means, it's important to identify where in the system we need to intervene in order to have the maximum impact. For the review and reflect of this particular um, ILO, I'm going to show you a video on climate feedback loops. And this helps to explain the different types of feedback loops in a system we've been talking about and how they affect the global atmosphere. A positive feedback loop occurs when one process causes a second process to occur, which then in turn causes the first process to occur more frequently. The Earth has several positive feedback loops that cause the plant to warm more quickly as the temperature increases. One of these positive feedback loops is the melting of polar sea ice. Sea ice reflects far more heat than ocean water. As sea ice melts, there is less heat being reflected by the ice and more heat being absorbed by the water, which causes the ocean water to warm at a faster rate. Warmer ocean water then causes the sea ice to melt even faster. Another loop is in Arctic permafrost. There is a significant amount of methane trapped in permafrost in the northern tundras of Canada, Alaska, and Siberia. As it gets warmer, more of this permafrost melts, releasing methane. Methane traps significantly more heat than CO2, which causes the permafrost to melt even faster. The good news is that these loops are still under control, meaning that the temperature increase from present day sea ice loss and permafrost melt will not be enough to create significant melting in the future. 
The bad news, however, is that if we don't take action on climate change immediately, then we run the risk of setting these loops off, which could lead to climate change that could literally be unstoppable and irreversible. Now for the final topic ILO, we're going to look at systems thinking and sustainability. In this particular TILO, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be introducing you to the iceberg model. Now the iceberg model is a is similar, but a different way of looking at a system compared to the six steps. So I would say you could use the six steps or the iceberg interchangeably. Um, it's not necessary that you use both those models, depending on which ones serves your needs best, you can use the six steps or the iceberg. So to use the iceberg, consider the story under analysis um, as you would an iceberg where at first just sort of the tip of the iceberg is seen because that's what you see in this picture. So that's the problem, that's the issue. This is typically a single event um, that in itself seems relatively harmless. And issues of environmental sustainability, it's usually a single human action. Throwing away a recyclable bottle, dumping oil down a drain, or driving a short distance instead of riding a bike or walking. So it's just a single event. In systems thinking though, the iceberg is a metaphor to explain the unseen, but still present structural and cultural influences that occur below the waterline and that are driving human choices within that particular system. So the iceberg model helps to analyze human behaviors within a complex system through considering them um, at increasingly deeper levels. At first as a single event, so what just happened, then as a pattern of events, then looking at the larger structures that help drive particular behaviors and at the deepest level, the mental models. So in other words, the assumptions or worldviews that people may be holding about their behaviors. So let's descend the iceberg um, into the iceberg model and look at each of the next levels. So next consider if the tip of the iceberg might represent a particular trend, does it happen more than once? So this is at the second stage? If so, what does the pattern of events look like? So this can be described in words or in behavior of a time graph, like presented earlier in step four of the um, six steps process. And then, men, and then moving on to the next level, looking at underlying structures, there are many, many types of structures that exist in the world. Some are natural and some are human made. So examples of structures that you'll find in nature can include say the food chain or predatory prey relationships, literal structural shapes of organisms. Examples of structures that are made by people are rules and laws and policy, for example, that govern behavior and literal structures such as a building or a fence. So it's really those institutionalized norms and structures that humans have and society has created over time that represent the underlying structures. The mental models or the deepest level of the iceberg are the beliefs that we hold about how the world works. It can sometimes be difficult to identify our own mental models um, because they're often embedded in how we think. A powerful aspect of doing systems thinking work in groups is in surfaces where the mental models exist and how they have led to the creation of certain structures um, over time. So if you think about the issue of say whaling, so in other words, uh, commercial whaling, what are the mental models that have allowed whaling to continue? You know, there are a lot of cultural beliefs about the value of whale meat, about, you know, property rights, about who owns the ocean, and therefore it's our right to be able to whale and to catch and consume whales for our pleasure. So, you know, at the deepest level, those are the hardest things to change. Another important, rather very important consideration in the iceberg model is this concept of leverage. 
So in systems thinking, the iceberg is a metaphor um, to explore the unseen but still present structural and cultural influences. But the more you, you're able to break down those structures and change mental models, the more likely you are to achieve lasting change and more sustainable change. So the further down um, the iceberg you go, the more the leverage increases. But having said that, you can certainly intervene at different stages of a system and different levels of the iceberg in order to enact change. And that's one of the key outcomes of systems thinking is if you want to change the whole system, no single solution is going to work. You need a range of solutions targeting different levels of the system in order for that change to be lasting. Okay, so I mentioned earlier the example of whale extinction or um, commercial whale, commercial whaling. So I'm going to leave this model with you. You can pause the video and have a look at how it is that this issue of whale extinction goes from the event to the patterns, to the structures, and finally to the mental models. Okay, for the review and reflect, um, I'm actually gonna get you to get your hands dirty and work on this mini case study on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is a massive island of floating plastic in the Pacific. So I want you to draw a, um, an iceberg model of this particular issue with the GPGP being the tip of the iceberg. Then what is happening at the different levels of the iceberg? Yeah, so this is the iceberg diagram that I'd like you to use. Um, you can either replicate it on a piece of paper or you can just think about the different stages. But so I've got the event there. I want you to think about the pattern. So do a little bit of your own research on the garbage patch, find out what's been happening over time, um, what structures are allowing this to happen and continuing to allow it to grow. Um, and finally, what are the mental models that we hold as a species that allow and have allowed for this to happen? The other thing I want you to think about, what are the potential leverage points in the system? So what kinds of solutions or what kinds of activities can different sectors, including business, civil society, governments, intergovernmental organizations, what role can they play? Or where can they intervene in the system to result in change and hopefully the disappearance of this garbage patch? Now, finally, it's important to look at the habits of a systems thinker and take stock of what kinds of activities you're already engaged in. So what is it that you do already? And what is it that you can really improve on at a personal level? So please pause the video now if you'd like to look at the picture in detail. Okay, so that's it um, for this topic. Uh, remember to review all the materials from this week, read and watch any of the prescribed materials for the next topic and complete any assessments that might be due um, in the next week or two. Thanks for your time.